so today I'm joined by uh, Professor Matthew Taylor, Professor of History at De Montfort University, and also archaeologist Jason Wood, who is a consultant who specialises in the heritage of sport. And today we're going to be talking about football, uh, the history and the archaeology of football. So um, I'm just wondering, Matthew, if we could start a little bit, if you could tell us a little bit about the history. How did football start? What's its origins? Well, you know, when football began is a, is a difficult question to answer, really, because I think people have probably always kicked a ball or, or, or carried a ball, you know, and played games based around that. But we've got some kind of fairly famous examples from different parts of the world. In China, there was a game called uh, Tuju, um, which goes back to the uh, third and second century BC. It's quite a ceremonial game. People will find clothes. It's a bit, it's a bit like a version of keepy uppy, keeping the ball up in the air. So it wasn't exactly the same at all as, as the game we know now. Um, and then across, you know, in the Middle Ages, across parts of Europe and elsewhere, there were various forms of folk football. You know, they would be matches between parts of villages, um, one village against another, taking place at certain times of the year, you know, Shrove Tide and Easter, various times like that. Um, very important for connecting different parts of the community together and um, the aristocracy and the, and the peasants and um, extremely violent, which is one reason why, you know, um, monarchs and, um, and local authorities continually tried to ban them. Um, but they were really important as kind of origins of, of uh, modern forms of football. Because these are um, not just um, certain people in a village, it's the entire village, isn't it? Yeah, no, I mean they would be they would be quite often community events, yeah, and they and you know very important festivities in in, in relation to particular t um, times of the year. So yeah, really important to the kind of culture of those areas, which I suppose you know a sport like football then picks up in later centuries. And yeah, in fact, you've still got um, some of those games that still continue today. So there's the bar games that you get still up in Scotland. Um, there's Ashbourne, isn't there? Um, as well so and even actually um, in Italy you've got Calcio Fiorentino as well that particular game there with involves 27 players on each side yeah and and, and still play partly you know for, tour, for tourists as much as anything else but it's a part of the culture and it's so much so that in, in Italy that the that their, their word for football is calcio, which has taken so that they can link, you know, modern football to their traditional game. So, yeah, those, these are still really important aspects of kind of cultural life in these areas. So when would you say um, football kind of as we know it um, in, in its modern sense, when did that start? It was really down, I think, in a way to... Um, the decision to write down rules, you know, because people would kind of just just remember the rules or pass them on, um, you know, all the. Um, but I think actually writing down the rules became becomes important. Codification becomes very significant, and the English public schools are very important in this process of codification. Initially, the public schools have their own versions of football, which are kind of exclusive, and so that if you've been to uh, Westminster or Winchester or Eton, Harrow, you know, you play that particular game. But increasingly, as kind of ex-public school boys went into, you know, everyday life, they wanted to continue playing and they wanted to continue playing in clubs and they needed to uh, arrive on a kind of universal code that everyone could, could agree on. So that was what led to the creation of, of a number of codes, most famously the Football Association Code. So the Football Association, when it was founded in London in 1863, you know, 13 rules, a composite code, which would, which would kind of, uh, which was then, I suppose, the, the start of the development of association football, although other codes continue to exist as well. So is this where football and rugby divided as well? Yeah, um, at that meeting, in fact, um, you know, there were representatives of, of, of um, clubs which played a kind of a form of football which was influenced by rugby school, hence the name, um, and Blackheath particularly, and those clubs kind of left because they they wanted to continue a game which which where they would be allowed to carry the ball and also where they'd be, be allowed to hack 
Hack was kicking the shins, and so they thought that was a very important uh, facet of football. Um, and and so they created a few years later the Rugby Football Union. Um, teams continued to play sometimes, mix and match the codes they played. You know, they might play one code in one half of a match, a different code in the other, or a return match. They might play different codes. And sometimes, you know, clubs clubs um, uh, would change from, from one code to the other. And very famously, quite late on, um, both of the kind of Bradford professional rugby league clubs moved um, in the early 1900s to, to play association football because they felt rugby league wasn't bringing the punters in, wasn't bringing enough people into the grounds and that they were, li- they were likely to make more money um, by uh, playing association football. So, so both, both Bradford City as it became and Bradford Park Avenue became soccer clubs when they'd previously been rugby league clubs. And it's interesting just to go back to you saying about you get teams that would play a game and swap um, the rules kind of halfway through. They'd play each other's rules. And you still get that today, for example, with um, the Australian and Ireland matches as well. They still play each other's rules and, and whatnot too, don't they? So that kind of in a form still continues. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they do occasionally, particularly, particularly Gaelic football and the Australian rules, they continue to play the, these these kind of uh, you know big because they're similar, those sorts of games. And in fact, all these forms of game codes across the world um, share similarities. Um, The the development of football was kind of transnational rather than just national. So people were moving around from place to place. Um, You know, uh, in in the British world and kind of the British Empire, sharing their forms of football and the best ways to create to create a game which would be good to play and good to watch. And I think the the, the kind of the nationalisation of these codes comes a bit later. So American football sees itself as something different and something connected to American identity a little bit later than, 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 than this kind of in the, in the early 20th century. At the, in the 1880s, 1890s, you know, they were just slightly different versions of, of, a, of a similar sort of broad, broad football game. And um, what do we know about women's football at this early stage? Well, um, it's one of those kind of hidden histories. It's one of those things that we, we don't know enough about, but we're increasingly learning more. I think there's no doubt that that women were involved in all these, you know, earlier forms of football, suju, uh, folk football, um, they were part of it. And we know that there, were the, there was a recorded game in, in Edinburgh in the early 1880s. There was a British Ladies Football Club, which was established in 1894. But it really developed um, women's football in connection to the First World War, when women worked in uh, munitions factories and they had more, more leisure time and... Um, wages in order to in order to to to, uh, be involved in leisure activity and football was very popular the men were at the trenches um and women wanted to fit there was in a sense that gap that sporting gap that women filled and uh, people would be incredibly surprised how popular women's football was you know we're talking at at its height you know just after the the first world war you had crowds of up to about fifty thousand at some matches fifty three thousand at one match at goodison park so they played on 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 uh, the grounds of, of men's football teams, uh, and um, 150 clubs across the UK. So this was popular stuff. Unfortunately, the FA banned it in 19, 1921 because they thought it was unsuitable for women, and also in a way because it was becoming a bit more bit too popular, I think, and taking some of the um, you know the attention away from the men's game. And actually, the, the, there were a few famous women footballers of that time. Um, I think Lily Parr is one. Yeah, I think Lily Parr's probably the best known. I think becoming increasingly well known. Um, she was um, from Preston, so she played for the kind of star team of the day, the kind of the Manchester City or Man United of the day, um, a team called Dick uh, Ladies. So it was named after the, it was a munitions factory and named after the owners, Mr. Dick and Mr. Kerr. Uh, and um, very successful team. It's a team that effectively represented England in a few times, kind of against teams from France. And they even toured North America in the early 1920s and played against men's teams. And uh, although the statistics are difficult to pin down, we're pretty sure that, that over a career which lasted a you know, number of decades, she played until the early 1950s, that Lily scored something like nearly a 1,000 goals in her career. Wow. Which makes her one of probably one of the, the greatest goal scorers of all time, male or female. Wow. Wow, amazing stuff. 
That really is. It's really um, great to get a little bit of a background there. Thank you, Matt. What, I, what I'd like to do now is um, uh, if we can go to Jason. Um, Jason, you've been actually doing some archaeology on football pitches. And there's a fantastic project that you, you're working on at the moment up in York um, at the stadium there, at the old stadium, Bootham Crescent. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, project? Sure. Well, the project um, was initiated by Historic England uh, over two years ago in response to the club's desire to relocate to an out-of-town uh, new stadium. Um, it was already been decided that the Bootham Crescent site would be redeveloped for housing. But Historic England, um, having witnessed um, over the last 30 years the um, redevelopment of many football stadia uh, and relocation of football grounds, uh, without any history or heritage uh, considerations being built into what came after. Historic England were very keen that they could intervene in the planning process and help to shape and drive the redevelopment of the site to best reflect the memories and history of York City. Now, this is really important, isn't it? Because, uh, as you say, there have been many stadiums um, uh, throughout the UK over the years, and I'm probably it's probably around the world, actually, mm -hmm. um, that have just been, you know, they've been moved out of town, rebuilt, uh, mm -hmm. all very fantastic, you know, nice new shiny stadiums. Um, but then the older stadiums just forgotten, bulldozed, houses go up and whatnot, and there's no memory. I mean, uh, one particular example is um, Bolton Wanderers' old place, Burnham Park. Yeah, yeah, Burnham Park, we're, we're particularly um, a poignant example because, of course, before the Bradford Stadium disaster in 85, it was the worst uh, death toll at a football match uh, in England. Um, uh, in 1946, uh, people were crushed on the terraces there, uh, presaging what was to happen uh, at Hillsborough, of course. Um, so you'd have thought that at the very least there would be some sort of memorial or acknowledgement of that disaster, let alone a club history uh, of Bolton Wanderers being commemorated in some way on that site, but it isn't. Uh, indeed, it's uh, part of the stadium where the disaster took place was sold off to a um, supermarket, even while the club was still in residence. And the site is now buried underneath another supermarket and a car sale room. Um, and there's nothing there to, to memorialise or, or bear witness to that long history and association. Um, so, yeah, the, the, there are plenty of examples, sadly, of football grounds having completely been uh, annihilated from the landscape with not a nod or trace of uh, history and heritage being being recorded. So um, this, is or, fan or, this is what's fantastic here, is that... Um, Historic England have been able to um, speak with the people that are, are, are developing, to speak with planners and the community yeah. and the football club. Well, that, um, that's what I was asked to do. I was brought in to to um, to capture people's memories, mainly the fan base uh, and the club, but also um, local residents and businesses, which were going to be affected by the relocation as well, and had views about how the site should be redeveloped. So. Um, so a wide consultation involving local politicians and, and local residences, uh, residents, as I say, uh, but principally the fans, the supporters. They're the custodians of the history of, of football clubs. Uh, their memories were what mattered here. Uh, and um, overwhelmingly, they came back saying, we want something tangible. We don't want just a street name. We want something tangible, some a focal point for memory they said, somewhere we could orientate ourselves once the stadium was gone, uh, and also, crucially, somewhere where they could pay their respects. Because we must remember that uh, numerous fans' ashes have been buried around the perimeter of the pitch over the many years the club have been there. And so this is also um, a graveyard in a way. And so it was important to recognise that, not just in a plaque on a wall, but actually to create um, some sort of lasting memorial to the site and and the fans. So there's going to be a memorial garden. What other features are there going to be? Okay, well, the memorial garden will be sited around or flanking a, a preserved section of terrace, uh, the terrace belonging to the, what is known, known as the popular stand opposite the main stand. 
uh, which was actually paid for by the supporters in 1932 when the club moved to Bluebird Crescent. So a section of that terrace at the halfway line would be preserved, about 25 concrete steps. Uh, but be underneath that terrace, there is a tunnel, a unique survival, um, uh, which are permitted fa rival fans to change ends of half time from the 1930s through to the 1960s. It was also, you can imagine, the, the scene of some confrontation as rival fans passed each other in a narrow tunnel at half time. Um, uh, and there's plenty of memories associated with this tunnel. So we felt, because of its unique survival, and the stories associated with it, and it was also used as an air raid shelter in the Second World War, so another layer of meaning there. We should seek to preserve a section through the tunnel and the terrace, and then the Memorial Garden naturally flanks, flanks that surviving feature, which will be opposite what the developers call public open space, so it'll be public accessible open space in front of this stand, uh, with the centre circle marked out as well, so as a, as a further point of of orientation. Fantastic stuff. And actually, you've done other excavations as well, haven't you? Um, so you've excavated at, at York, but um, do you want to talk a little bit about the um, the finds at uh, Bradford? At Bradford Park Avenue, there was a ground that went out of use in the 1970s uh, and wasn't redeveloped uniquely um, because it sort of had a covenant over it. it, meant that it could only be used for sport or leisure. So it survived as a sort of ruin a ruined football ground with trees growing and standing on the terraces where people used to stand. And we did an, an art and archaeology project there a few years ago um, called Breaking Ground, excavated the goal mouth at the home supporters end, um, found not just the goalpost holes, as you might imagine, but crucially also um, uh, some objects, some coins, uh, some marbles and a nappy pin. Now, coins we later discovered from, from having volunteers on the dig who were old enough to remember the ground, said, oh, well, those will be the half-time collection. And we said, what's that? And they said, well, as kids, we used to walk around the, the touchline at half-time with a big sheet or blanket, and people, you throw coins from the terraces, and they'd be collected for a local charity. But obviously, over the 70-odd years of use of this ground, coins will have missed those blankets and fallen down around the goal there. We, we discovered them. The marbles we discovered were thrown by a culprit who later owned up to it and he got evicted from the ground in the 1950s for throwing them at the opposing goalkeeper. Uh, but there was this nappy pin, which we couldn't really explain. We thought no. maybe, you know, it uh, mended a hole in the net or something. But the, a lady turned up one day in tears saying, well, her father, she hadn't been to the site since her father died. Her father turned out to be the, the goalkeeper for Bradford Park Avenue between the walls, 15 odd years he played for the club. And on one memorable occasion, his shorts fell down around his ankles. Oh. The elastic went and the trainer ran on and patched him up with nappy pins, uh, much to the hilarity in, uh, on the cot behind the goal. And at the next home match, he was showered with nappy pins uh, and even posted several to his home, and she brought a tin he kept of all the nappy pins piece that people had thrown or posted to him. And why? You know, how would we have come to that conclusion? <laughs> no, I mean that's really with archaeology basic. alone. When you think about, you know, archaeology on older sites, might be Bronze Age, Roman, Medieval, yeah. whatever, um, and you're interpreting finds that you're identifying, you're interpreting. What's this find doing here? Why? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, I mean, to come up with that idea, you know, if you, if you were to find lots of pins in Roman times altogether, the last yeah. thing that you would think that there was some kind of game and some kind of, you know, <laughs> a joke or whatever. Um, yeah. I, I mean, that's just really interesting, isn't it? Well, it, it yeah. reinforces one of the reasons I was interested in doing the project. Uh, it was, was to test how accurate as archaeologists mm. we can be with our interpretations. Now, I'm used to working on Roman sites. Um, where you know you can come up with any explanation, yeah. prehistoric sites even more so. Um, but when you're digging a site within living memory, and people helping you dig are people who remembered it as it was, you have the, the beauty of being able to have that that oral history go alongside the archaeological, uh, cult, you know, um, yeah. material culture. Uh, and indeed, while I was excavating the goalpost hole, a guy came up to me with a photograph of himself leaning against. The original goalpost mm -hmm. on the last game that, that was ever played at the stadium. He said, "Here, I like you know, look at that." Oh. And when you know, 
wouldn't it be nice if a Roman soldier tapped you on the shoulder at the end of digging a, a, oh, a, Roman, a Roman post hole and showed you a picture of what the Barrett block looked like? Uh, well, that that would be very useful. Wouldn't it? <laughs> but, you know, and, and so we were obviously we must be making mistakes each time we, we excavate as archaeologists. But to have the social history as that corrective. Uh, and But the important thing here, I think, was that with the nappy pin encapsulates this story, yeah. is that without the excavation, that lady would never have visited the site mm -hmm. and, and would never have told her, us or perhaps anybody else that story. Mm -hmm. So we'd have lost that piece, that crucial bit of oral history and social history. So without the archaeology, we don't have the social history. And without social history, we don't interpret the archaeology. You need both. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, actually, I'm just reminded of an early uh, Time Team episode where um, John Gator and his team doing geophysics um, and they're, they're up north. And in fact, I believe you were on uh, this excavation, weren't you? <laughs> and, it was um, one of the early, early Time Teams, yeah. John does his, uh, his geophys, gets really, really excited uh, because basically they they pick up a, a kind of semicircular kind of shape, think it's an apse, maybe like Roman or something like that. Oh, fantastic. We've got this building. Actually, turns out that it's a football pitch. Yeah, it's a, it's a D and part of the part, part of the D and part of the uh, penalty area. This this was something we um, later used again with that knowledge uh, mm -hmm. at Bradford and indeed at, at York using John's colleague, um, Chris Gaffney from the University of Bradford's team, uh, because you can trace the outline of a football pitch using geophysics. Mm. Um, even though the white lines are gone, the liming of the soil leaches into the ground and is preserved and therefore results in an anomaly in the geophysics. And, 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 the, and at the excavation at York, we, even when we took the turf off, the white lines were still there in the ground because the line had leached so far into the soil. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? So you actually get a football line in an archaeological section. Yeah, you do. And you get the turf lines as well from constant re-turfing of, of the gull area, which of course gets chewed up uh, every season. Particularly at the baseball ground, I remember, it used to be in a horrible, horrible pitch, Matt. <laughs> it was. <laughs> The baseball ground, Derby's old ground, it used a notoriously bad pitch <laughs> and they would have had to constantly return it. <laughs> Actually, um, Matthew, this is uh, maybe a good time to ask you because we know you're a Derby fan um, and we've just been talking about, you know, the, the, the importance and the power of um, kind of fans and their memories of places. Um, you got any stories for us relating to Derby? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think what Jason said is, is absolutely highlighted how important, you know, memory is and the fact that, you know, um, football supporters are, are historians. They know about the history of their club, but also their personal memories and their connections with with um, stadiums and aspects of the history, matches they've won in the past, et cetera, et cetera. So at Derby County, um, uh, at the moment, we've got a, a new stadium, one of the um, reasonably new kind of... Um, uh, created in, in the 1990s, looks like many other stadiums. But um, there are kind of some new kind of inventions of memory, really, that have taken place. Um, we had a very famous player, um, Steve Bloomer, who played for us um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And well, the team now comes out to the song Steve Bloomer's Watching, which um, it would be nice if that was a, a song which was from that period, but it was actually a song um, written by two Derby supporters in the 1990s when we moved ground but it allows you to connect, kind of connect to that memory and now Steve Bloomer is better known by the younger supporters than he would have been previously and there's also a bust of Bloomer on the on the halfway line which is you know again another indication of how important you know these um, kind of collective and personal memories are to the way in which people relate to, to, to their football clubs and, and give it meaning really. Yeah absolutely. How does this kind of compare with your historical research? Obviously, I'm guessing you look more at kind of documents and things like that. You know, here we're talking about archaeology and finds. How can that help enhance what everyone does? Well, I think it does. I think increasingly we're kind of looking at, at various, you know, um, sources and various ways of understanding these things which can't necessarily be 
be captured you know, on in, in you know, official documents and newspapers and things like that. We, we can know a certain amount, but, you know, how do we know what things mean? And it's actually kind of tugging away at these sorts of things, as Jason has, has, has mentioned, kind of, we find, you know, we can find artefacts, but then we can try and find out, you know, what the meanings were attached to that. So I think the kind of material culture of football, you know, however we find it and whether it's, whether we, we find it um, a, a, an archaeological site or whether it's up in up in someone's loft or something like that, these sorts of aspects that, you know, a scrapbook or something like that, what it meant to people at the time. You know, I think that can add because something like football is, is, is actually, you know, it's incredible, you know, um, uh, repository of meaning and, 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 and uh, what, what and a key part of people's lives. And I think we lose that sometimes in a very kind of dry, dry historical, even kind of social historical reading of, of something like the history of football. Yeah, absolutely. It's very much an alive thing, isn't it? And, and you get these traditions being passed on as well and, and, and develop and grow and change, which is fantastic, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's that's crucial. And that, that's happening all the time. You know, and I suppose these these projects like this just just uh, are fascinating in the way you kind of can connect the past and the present. And actually, there are, in fact, some short films that Historic England um, have made that you can catch on YouTube. We'll put a link up um, that Jason has been involved in. And they're brilliant because they're, they're talking to members of the community, to fans, and just kind of logging that process um, of the uh, of the project and of the stadium and the developments that are happening there. So we'll put that link up as well. And actually, speaking about um, artefacts, um, actually, Jason's trowel is now in the National Football Museum. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about that a little bit? Well, it, it was the trial I used to excavate um, one of the goalpost holes at Bradford Park Avenue, which at the time uh, we felt was a world first uh, for an archaeologist to excavate a goalpost hole. So uh, the exhibition we put on about the project in the National Football Museum, uh, the chief exhibit was my trial. Not the nappy pin, not the coins, not the marbles, but my trial. <laughs> Immortalised. Immortalised, yes. <laughs> um, And also, uh, just to mention, I know that um, both of you have written books and uh, various publications, which we can put links up to. Uh, but I've got here um, a copy of um, Professor Taylor's book, um, Football Short History, um, Shire Books. Um, and it, oh, Shire Library even, and it's really good, very short history, um, but it's got lots of lovely colour photos in and some real detail there about um, the history of football. So, yeah, anyone interested in uh, learning a bit more about it? Oh, and here we have the article, actually, um, that's in um, British Archaeology magazine um, currently um, in uh, July uh, 2021, uh, but it's online for free. Um, so this is the Council of British Archaeologies magazine and um, the uh, Historic England project at Bootham Crescent. There's an article uh, on that there so people can find out more about it there. Thank you both so much for um, speaking today. It's been really great to meet you both over Zoom um, and to find out much more about the history of football and the archaeology of football. Who'd have thought? <laughs> So good luck with your various projects and thanks so much for catching up with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Bye. We can't do any of this work without you. So please subscribe, back us on Patreon and make sure that Time Team comes back again.